If you're visiting here today, we're glad you're here. And I'm particularly glad for families that have come and filled out a row or two. I appreciate that. I have my daughter's family and Dan's family here with us today, sitting up here next to Margaret. My dear granddaughters, my grandson, my dear daughter Angie, and my grandson Dan. It's good to have you guys with us, and good to have you other families. Of course, I'm biased, but I believe you're in the right place today. And I pray for all the other believers and seekers and people who are looking to find something more in their life on this mountain today who are filling the other churches. What really matters? What makes a difference? All of us have had experiences in life. We have economic advisors. We have representatives to Congress. We have doctors and psychiatrists. We have all manner of people around us lending advice and direction to our lives. And yet, too often, our lives are not quite together, right? Kind of empty sometimes. You see, there's another thing that we need to consider. And that's what this day is all about. That life is about more than preserving the flesh and being successful and having some direction in our life. Life is about being in harmony and relationship with God. My Bible says that God created us in his image. Well, preachers have done a lot with that. Pretty much all of us understand it's a spiritual image. But you see, every one of us has that spiritual image in it. And that image doesn't develop. It's weak. It's lost unless it's connected to God. Do we understand that? And what Jesus did for us, he came and gave us a connection. For those of you who relate to this, Jesus is the bridge over troubled waters. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no other. And, and we can debate it in our hearts and our minds, but until we come to that understanding, our lives will be unsettled. It'll be like the waves of the sea. But when we come to that understanding, then the peace of God descends upon us. And we can say, thank you, Lord. And we can have peace. Easter is a season of light. And that was the pagan's joy when spring returned because the long, dark, toilsome winter was disappearing and now light was coming. They called it Ostre, after the German goddess of the dawn. The symbols of eggs and bunny rabbits and rich colors helped them rejoice in the new life that was sparking up before them, all around them. In 1595, Pope Gregory sent 40 monks from St. Andrew's Monastery in Rome to England to convert the pagan Anglo-Saxons. Do we have any Anglo-Saxons here? <laughs> Come on, be honest. Yeah. <clears throat> he told the monks to leave the old festivals in place, but to Christianize them. And there was a near-perfect fit between the pagan Easter and the resurrection of Christ to light, to life. It was fervent providential that Jesus said in the scripture, I am the light of the world. And we read in John's gospel, the first chapter, in him is life and the life was the light of men. There was a true light which coming into the world enlightens every man, and that's Jesus. Scientists tell us right now that we are filled with light. That surprised me, but evidently within our biological structure, there's a generation of light. It's dim, it's small, but it's still there. 
and they tell us that we're radiating that light. The Imago Dei, the image of God, the light in us, seeking to be reconnected to God. And in the pagan mind, out of the new light came the resurrection of the dead world. And so the name Easter stuck, and it was used all of these centuries, and we use it today. But Jesus' advent, that is his appearing among us, is the greatest of miracles of God, who chose to come to us personally and heal our iniquities. But it's not only his first advent, which we know as Christmas, but his his second advent that catches our attention because Jesus said, I'm coming again. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. That's the blessed hope. And, And too often we come and we celebrate Easter And we forget what it means. I mean, Jesus is alive. And we all say, glory, hallelujah. But what does that mean? It means that Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of the Father, waiting for the command in the day when he comes again for his church. Hallelujah. And that needs to be our anticipation. And and when you're saved in Jesus Christ and you anticipate his second coming, then your whole life, is filled with light. Things begin to change. The problems that we face fall away and we have a new victory in Jesus Christ. Remember what our Lord said, in the world you have tribulation, but rejoice, glory, hallelujah, amen, Amen. for I have overcome the world. That's the power of Christ. Jesus' second coming is one of five points of doctrine that this church believes. You have it on the back of your bulletin. We believe Jesus was born of a virgin. We believe he's fully God and fully man. We believe that he atoned for our sins on that cross. We believe that he was bodily resurrected from the dead. That's the one that our culture and time goes, Wow. Dead men don't rise. If we took any of you and we isolated your room and we interrogated you and we asked you to dead men rise, the first thing that comes to your mind is nope. But then you remember, there was a man, fully God and fully man, who was crucified dead and he resurrected from the dead. And, and remember, The tomb was empty. You say, well, pastor, somebody could have come and stole him away. Listen, the Romans and the Jews were intent upon proving that Christ was not for what he said. They were intent upon finding that body. They searched through Jerusalem. They searched all over the place, and they did not find the body. You've got to meditate on these things. History tells us this, not just the Bible. But all the historical accounts, Josephus and others, talk about the Christ who was resurrected to life again. That's who we believe in. And more than that, (laughs) because he's alive, he's coming again. Well, unfortunately, the doctrine of Jesus coming again doesn't go to a whole lot of attention in church because we're spending a lot of time like Jesus spent. Jesus went around doing good. That's what the Bible says. Helping people, encouraging people, healing, doing miracles. His intent and his idea was to relate to people and to lift us up and encourage us. And so the church continues in that vein. And then they, they, we believe if we come to church, somehow the, the dew point will come down upon us and we'll be blessed and, and our lives might be a little better. But what about the end? What about our passing? And where do we go? You see, the blessed hope that we have as Christians 
is that we're going to be with Jesus and that he's coming again and we're coming with him and he's going to be Christos Victor, Christ the Victor. That's what we believe. You say, well, pastor, you're pushing me a little too much because I, I haven't really been trained in this or prepared for this. I don't really have the education. You don't need the education. All you need is to come before God, as the Bible says, repent, confess, believe, and trust God at his word. And then we have the victory. And then we have salvation. If you confess with your mouth, the Bible says, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. See how important that is? Then you shall be saved. Not maybe or possibly, but you shall be saved. And that's what faith is all about. You know, you talk to people about faith. I have faith in Christ. Well, how can you have faith in somebody who lived 2,000 years ago? How can you have faith that you go out on this highway and you're not going to buy the farm? We have faith all the time. Faith is part of our fabric as human beings. So why don't we put faith where it belongs? In him. Too often the, the world around us begins to infect our minds and our hearts. And we're like those people that Peter described in the scripture who say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. And then Peter tells them, he's not slow about his promise of coming. For a day is a thousand years to God, and a thousand years is a day. Our future view, like those scoffers, is blurred and attached to how we feel in the day, not to the word of God. We have to make that transition. As we believe this word and put our trust in this word, then the spirit works upon us and we're able to grow and be strengthened in our spiritual lives. But until we take that step, we're just going to be earth men and women, living from day to day, Kerthump, 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 until the veil of death is pulled over us. You know, many have written about this. Musicians have sung songs about it, about the tragedy of man. But you see, in Christ Jesus, there's no longer a tragedy. There's a victory. And that empty tomb is the consummation of that victory. That is the reset of history. And don't let other people tell you about another reset, because that is the reset of history. Amen. One out of every 30 verses in the Bible mentions in some way Christ's return at the end of time. Of the 260 chapters in the New Testament, there are well over 300 references to Christ's return. 23 of the 27 New Testament books mention Christ's return. It should grab our attention that when Jesus was resurrected from the dead and returned to heaven, it was indeed that great reset. The Bible says, when they had come together after the resurrection, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus told them that they could not know, but they would receive power when the Holy Spirit had come upon them to be overcomers in the world. We are overcomers. You who believe in Jesus Christ, please capture this understanding. You have the victory, and you are able in the power of Christ to be overcomers. You can speak the word and God will act upon that word that you speak. That's hard for us to understand, I know, but indeed, that's what faith is about. When Jesus spoke to that father, whose son was an epileptic and fallen in the fire, and he says, your disciples could not heal him, the father said, if you can, if you can, do something for me. 
And Jesus said, if you can, don't you believe? And the father said, I believe, help thou me in my own belief. Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus was resurrected from the dead? Have you pronounced those words? Or are you still troubled by it? Are you still wondering? You say, well, I like church, and I, I like the Christian people I'm around, and, and I enjoy these things, but, but I, I'm just not able to step over that line and say, I believe. What do you believe? Are you like Lucy Van Pelt in the Peanuts comic strip that said, I believe in me. That's who I believe in. I'm the one I believe in. Is that who you are? Or are you able to say, Lord God of heaven and earth, be merciful to me, a sinner. I believe in you. Redeem me. Does that remind you of the thief on the cross? Lord, I believe. This day you shall be with me in paradise. And Jesus had given them final instructions outside of Jerusalem at that 40th day. And he was lifted up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And what comes next is most important. For there were two angels that appeared to them and said, This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. That's the second coming. Did you hear that? He's coming in the same way. Are we ready? Jesus speaks in parables about his second coming. If we look in Luke's gospel in the 12th chapter, we read, you too be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Are you expectant of Jesus coming? Is Jesus coming today? Are you ready for that? Or are you saying, like the scoffers in the time that Peter was writing, it's been a long time, he hasn't shown up yet. I don't have to worry about it. Jesus begins the passage in Luke by saying, Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps alight. He then continues to describe the Hebrew tradition of waiting for the bridegroom to return from, to the wedding feast. We have a better memory of this tradition in Matthew's revised a rendition of the parable of the ten virgins. In that parable, there are ten virgins who are waiting for the bridegroom to come to his bride's house for the wedding feast. Five were foolish, they had no oil for their lamps, and five were prudent, they had oil for their lamps. And oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Are you in the Holy Spirit? Is your lamp filled with oil? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready to receive the Lord? And while they were foolish, the bridegroom came and they missed him. We don't want to miss God. We don't want to miss Jesus. Jesus ends the parable with a similar expression as that recorded in Luke. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. The day nor the hour of what? For Jesus' second coming. You see, decisions are always before us. We're going to make decisions this week. What are you going to do about your bills? What are you going to do about your relationships with your relatives? What are you even going to do in terms of your thoughts about what's happening within our country and our politics and all of these things crowd into our mind and they crowd out the basic thing that we should be concerned about and that basic thing is what am I doing with Jesus you see when Thomas the doubter missed Jesus coming the first time when he appeared among the disciples he said unless I see him 
and put my hands in the wounds, I will not believe. This is the same Thomas that asked Jesus in the upper room when Jesus said that he's the way to heaven. And Thomas said, we don't know what the way is. What is it? He said, I am the way. You see, if, if we want to be redeemed as human beings and we want to have a Christian understanding of what God is telling us, then we need to give ourselves to Christ, for he is the way. He is our elder brother. He is the one who's speaking the truth to us. He's the one that's calling us. And, and how can we believe that? Because he was crucified, dead. We know he was buried. And on the third day, according to the scripture, he was resurrected again. And he was seen by 500 people. And he stood there with the disciples outside of Jerusalem. And he said to them, wait here until the spirit comes. And then he was lifted up from them into this cloud, as we read before. And that's the Shekinah glory of God. It wasn't just a cloud filled with raindrops. It's the Shekinah glory of God that filled the temple when Isaiah was in the temple. And he fell on his face and he said, Oh, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. But you see, what really gets me is that we're caught up in this same pattern that our ancestors clear back to Adam were caught up in. <coughs> and when the disciples are standing there looking up into heaven with their mouths agape, two angels appeared and the angels said to them, my paraphrase, what are you boys doing standing here gaping into heaven? For this Jesus will come in the same way you've seen him go. And the spirit said, get out there and make it happen because the baton has been passed to you. Do we understand that? Do we understand that Jesus has given us the baton and now we're the ones who are to speak the gospel. We're the ones who are to proclaim healing. We're the ones who are to proclaim the righteousness of God. We're the ones to cast out the demonic. We're the ones to speak these words because the spirit lives within us. I understand this may be too supernatural for some of you. I was a psych major in college. I thought psychology was the way to bring in the millennium to help man to find his way. And then that mindset, it is too supernatural. But what is consciousness? What happens when a person dies and the body they've lived in all those years is suddenly lifeless? And their consciousness has gone somewhere else. What is that? If not supernatural, is it not supernatural that your minds are working? You say, well, it's my brain that has all of that. Well, what about these classic brain images, injuries where individuals' brains are, are damaged in such a way that they shouldn't even be able to think straight, and yet they do? You can read about it. You can research all of this. We can get all of this information. But finally, what it comes down to is that in Jesus Christ, we find the perfect human being, that one who lived his life without sin, who was totally obedient to the Father, who went to the cross as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. He made the trip. He did the work. And we are the beneficiaries. And his act on the cross was approved by God who raised him from the dead. It is not for us to know the times of the seasons, Jesus told us that. Is Jesus coming today, tomorrow? A month from now? I don't know. There's been many in the Christian community who are predicted by dates when Jesus is coming again. I think of Harold Camping in California who had a great evangelical ministry. And he predicted Jesus coming not once, but twice, and he was wrong both times. And people then stand back and laugh to see there. 
Well, we need to take the Lord of his word. We don't know. But we know he's coming again. And that's the promise of Easter. It's the light from the empty tomb. It's the light of the Lord being raised up into the kind of glory of God. It's the light that we receive as individuals. Jesus said, I will come again. That's once. Jesus asked, when the Son of Man comes again, will he find faith on the earth? Likewise, when Jesus was lifted up, the angel told the disciples, get busy. He's coming again. So, brothers and sisters, you who are in Christ, those of you who are seeking Christ, those of you who are on the margins, stay alert because Jesus is coming again. And this is advice from one man. You can take it any way you want. But don't believe everything you're hearing. Believe the word. What does the word say? And when the word says something and we take it to heart and some talking head stands up and says something different, it stands out like a sore thumb. Don't be deceived. That's the devil's activity. Jesus says he's a deceiver. He's a liar. He's a murderer. The devil is going about accusing all of us day in and day out. And we don't need to do his work. We need to do the work of faith. And the work of faith is to believe, to trust Jesus, to take him at his word. And when we get into a calamity of some kind, instead of wringing our hands and crying out, what am I to do? We pronounce the word of God. Oh, Lord God, righteous one of heaven and earth, take me from this problem. Deliver me. And I pray it in the name of Jesus by his blood. Amen. And then it happens. And we're amazed. But why we should be, why should we be? Because we're made in the spirit of God. So how are you doing? Shall we pass our report cards? How many A's do we have in here? We got a few. James, the Lord's half-brother, says, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. We need to be doers of the word. And what did Jesus command us to do? Love one another even as I have loved you. It's hard to love some people, but God loves us. He loves everyone equally. It doesn't matter what your religious perspective is. God still loves you. It doesn't matter if you're in prison or if you're working diligently, he still loves you. That's the power of God. It's a redemptive power. And we are called to do that same work. One of my favorite writers is A.W. Tozer. He was a pastor and theologian, and he wrote a book entitled, Preparing for Jesus' Return. And in the book, Tozer writes about our blessed hope which is Jesus coming again. And he considers all the ramifications of holding this hope near and dear. And Tozer approaches the biblical prophecy as an evangelical mystic, even as John was the beloved. Instead of focusing on the details and coming up with an end time escape plan, he focuses on Jesus, the Lord of life, and we should do the same. Tozer asks two questions. And I ask him of us today, what have you done with Jesus? And the second question is, are you ready for his return? And this is the biblical proclamation. Maranatha, O Lord, come. Come again. Be blessed, Lord. May thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. 
and may your will be fulfilled. O Heavenly Father, Jehovah, Yahweh, God of heaven and earth. Amen. Our Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for drawing us to the word, and thank you for filling us with the light that you have. Oh, Lord, I pray for every precious person here, all of us, that, Lord, we would not walk in the paths of unrighteousness, that we would not walk in doubt and distress, but that, Lord, we would turn to you and receive what you have for us openly and willingly. And may this Easter be the doorway into a great future for many. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.